imperfectly rational creatures believe two things that contradict one another. If we were perfectly rational, we wouldn't violate the requirement of theoretical reason that we, we don't hold contradictory views. But we imperf imperfectly rational beings sometimes do. Sometimes do contradict ourselves, have conflicting beliefs. I mean, we have all, each of us has many, 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 many beliefs. And we can't keep them all in mind at the same time. And so somewhere in the web of our beliefs, there might be two that contradict one another. That's irrational, but we are imperfectly rational beings. So sometimes, analogously, we violate the principle of non-contradiction. But if we always violate the principle of non-contradiction, if we never respect the law of non-contradiction, if whenever I say that I believe P, something or other, I also say that I believe not P, not just like locally I contradict myself, but globally I contradict myself. If whenever I say I believe something, I also sincerely say that I believe the contrary. Well, pretty soon you're going to start to doubt whether I know what I'm talking about, whether I really believe in those things. Well, pretty soon you're going to start to doubt whether I know what it is to have a belief if I always say one thing and contrary. Pretty soon you're going to doubt if I really do consistently assert P and not P. Everything I say I believe, I also believe the contrary. Pretty soon you're going to start to doubt whether I have any beliefs at all. If I always do. Similarly, if I occasionally fail to take the necessary means to my end, well, you'll say I'm being irrational there. But if I never take the necessary means to my end, if I, whenever I say something is my goal, and that goal, that end, sits idly there, and I never take any steps toward realizing it, well, you will start to question whether those really are my ends at all, whether those really are things that I'm willing. And if I never take steps to achieve any goals, well, that at some point, you're going to start doubting whether I'm willing anything at all. You're still going to start doubting whether I have a will at all. Maybe you'll think I'm just acting in random ways, rather than in a way that's directed towards certain goals. OK, so the point is that in both of these cases, what I'm calling the hypothetical imperative on the practical side, and the principle of non-contradiction on the theoretical side. In both of these cases, because we are imperfectly rational, there are going to be, as I say, local, occasional violations of this principle. That's what it means to say we're imperfectly rational. But there can't be too many violations of these, or else we're going to lose the grip of the thought that there are beliefs at all or that there's a will at all. OK, questions about that? Right, so I just want to mention um, imperatives of prudence very briefly here. Um, on uh, 31, making 4 18. It says, the imperatives of prudence would totally and entirely coincide with those of skill and be equally analytic if only it were so easy to provide a determinate concept of happiness. Uh, so these just, uh, so imperatives of prudence are going to be hypothetical imperatives 
directed to a specific but indeterminate end of happiness. If that end were in fact determinate, these would be just uh, imperatives of skill, just like any other. But the concept of happiness, the goal here that individuals are assumed to be aiming at, individuals, individual human beings who are imperfectly rational, who have empirical inclinations and desires, um, are assumed to be aiming at have, have the goal of their own happiness. Um, but unfortunately, right before 18, happiness is so indeterminate a concept that even though every human being wishes to achieve it, yet he can never say determinately and in agreement with himself what he actually wishes and wants. And this is because, he continues, the elements that belong to the concept of happiness are one and all empirical. Um, so what makes us happy is empirical, and so we can never be certain of its content. We can take good guesses, we can base our judgment about what will make us happy on past experience, but just like any other empirical science, we're going to be fallible. What we take to be true could be uh, refuted by further empirical evidence. Um, and so, uh, what this means, the very bottom of 31 to 32, is that the imperatives that tell us how to achieve this indeterminate end are going to be basically rules of thumb. They're not going to be strict commands. Um, they're only going to be recommendations. That's what he says at the very bottom. Um, imperatives of prudence cannot, to be precise, command at all. That is, present actions objectively as practically necessary. There could be taken instead as counsels rather than as commands of reason. Uh, and the problem of determining reliably and universally which action would advance the happiness of a rational being is perfectly, uh, is insoluble. And hence there can be no imperatives with regard to it that would in a strict sense command. Okay, but obviously, um, the real question that Kant is interested in is how an imperative of morality is possible. Because this has to be categorical. It asserts that somebody must do something for its own sake, not as the means to some further effort. That something, some action, is good in itself. Its value doesn't derive from its serving as a means to some What's the condition? 
So I, I just said like the general form of a hypothetical imperative, like this and that. So I don't know what to fill in there until the condition is given. What's the condition? The end, sure. So until I know what the hypothetical imperative's end is, what the condition for taking the means to be good is, I don't know what it's going to say. Once you tell me what the end is, condition on the means being good is, then we can fill it in. Fill it in with whatever it is that's going to bring about that end. So, one more time. When I think of a hypothetical imperative as such, I do not know in advance what it will contain until I'm given the condition. The condition that would make the means good. So a hypothetical imperative is going to tell us to do something on the condition that some further end is good. And I don't know what it's going to tell me to do until I know what the end is supposed to be. Is that clear? Okay. But when I think of a categorical imperative, I know at once what it contains. There's not supposed to be a condition on, the, on a categorical imperative. It says not that some action is valuable in order to bring about something else. It doesn't say, on the condition that some further end is good, this will be good. It just says, this is good. It just says that this is rationally required. Good in itself, not as means to bring about some further end. For since besides the law, the imperative contains only the necessity of the maxim to conform with this law, whereas the law contains no condition to which it was limited, nothing is left but the universality of law as such. Nothing is left but the universality of law as such, with which the maxim of the action ought to conform, and this is the conformity of, sorry, and it is this conformity alone that the imperative actually represents as necessary. Um, So there is, he says, therefore, only a single categorical imperative, and it's this. Act only according to that maxim through which you can at the same time will that it become a universal law. So this is the formula of universal law. Okay, so, I mean, this really isn't so different than what we saw earlier when we talked about what I told you would be the categorical imperative. So a categorical imperative has to represent some action, or actually a maxim, an action for a reason. Has to represent an action together with its reason as good in itself. If it wasn't being represented as good in itself, it would be represented as good for something else, and that would be a hypothetical imperative. So a categorical imperative has to be representing some action together with its reason, that is, maxim, as good in itself. Not on the assumption that anything else is good. And that means directly that if the action, that is the maxim, is objectively good, it has to be objectively good itself, not in order to bring about some further end, but just objectively good. And if it's objectively good, it has to be universalizable. Because it's supposed to be objectively good. Not Ooh. just seemingly good to me, or not just apparently good to you, but actually objectively good. Something that's good, period. Something that's good, therefore, for everyone. So it has to be universalizable. And there can't be anything more than that. If there were anything more than that, if there were some further condition that had to be placed on the maxim, besides its fitness to be able to be universalized, then that would, Kant would say, would make it a hypothetical imperative. That it would be good only under those additional conditions. We could question whether those additional conditions would be, in fact, good. 